Hi everyone, thanks for coming uh, for my next story for the paranormal. For this story, um, I'm up here in Chin Sui Temple, which is extremely beautiful. And uh, it was originally built by a native of a Fujian province, and his name was Tan Sri Lim Go Tong. He's from this province called Angxi. In their history, they had a very powerful and a wonderful benevolent monk. And this monk's name was uh, Reverend Chin Sui. He was very pious, and at a very young age, he was already not interested in money, power, position, and he left home early to go and study to become a great master and along with his Buddhist studies and becoming a Buddhist scholar he also mastered medicine. Through medicine he can heal a lot of people for free, he didn't take anything by using um, his healing abilities and his healing abilities wasn't anything supernatural but he knew the art of traditional Chinese medicine. Not only that he received a lot of donations and the donations that he received he had built bridges for people because crossing over rivers and gorges were very difficult for the common people. So in his kindness, he built over nine to 10 bridges in his lifetime. And he became very famous because he had the ability to create rain and affect the weather. And what was incredible is that um, when people had huge droughts, they really were dependent on crops. They were really dependent on their farming, their fields. So if there was no rain, there's no crops, millions of people will starve. So what happened was, he would do prayers, maybe to Kuan Yin, maybe to Buddha Shakyamuni, I'm not sure, but he would create the rain to fall. People from many, many different areas and from his own province that came to receive his blessings, receive Dharma teachings, and also um, get healing, and occasionally to create rain. But during his lifetime, they had built a temple there called Chin Sui, and that was his name, Reverend Chin Sui. They built a temple for him up in the mountains where it was green and luscious and had beautiful spring water. And he really liked the scene. He really liked staying up there. And he blessed the area, blessed the environment and the springs became healing. So people from thousands and thousands of miles around would come to get water and be healed. So after he had passed away, the people in Angxi actually um, buried his holy body in that very temple. And so from this, the Chin Sui type of practice and devotion and temples started to spread. People started erecting temples to Reverend Chin Shui all over Fujian province. And when the Fujian people started immigrating to Taiwan and Malaysia and various parts of Asia, they also rebuilt the monastery and temples just like that. And the funny thing is certain places where they built, where there was water and natural springs, it became curative again, even now in modern times. And that's where I am right now. I'm in Chin Sui Temple, which is about 45 minutes to one hour drive away from Kuala Lumpur. It's beautiful. It's got a main prayer hall. The main prayer hall has a statue of Reverend Chin Sui himself. And it's very black in color is because the legend goes that he actually was taming very powerful malicious spirits in his region. And he was locked into a cave with these spirits having psychic um, wars and during the process, they tried to burn him. They couldn't, but the suit had made his face black. So the depiction of this um, Chin Sui Reverend is always he's had, they paint him black to represent the suit. And also he's wearing monk robes. So here in Chin Sui Temple, you'll see that. You'll see a beautiful, beautiful temple. And then I'm upstairs on the temple. There's a vegetarian restaurant here. And then there's a hall of Shakyamuni. There's a beautiful um, Kuan Yin statue on top of the hill. And also behind me during the day, you can see um, the 10 levels of hell, all right? I'm gonna do another blog on that soon, and then you can see more. The 10 levels of hell, and behind that, there's a huge outdoor Buddha built, and the purpose of that outdoor Buddha was to bless the whole area, bless the whole region, and bless the whole environment. The Feng Shui master to Tan Sri had requested him to open a place where they can build a huge Buddha to bless the whole land, to kind of magnetize the area. And we are 4,600 feet above sea level, by the way. Tan Sri actually brought his culture over here to Malaysia. And when he saw this area, it reminded him of Fujian. It reminded him of where he lived. And he liked it, and he thought it was misty, lush, green, and cooling. So what happens, he totally brought over the practice of Chin Sui, and he reproduced the temple here. And this temple here is built in 1976 and it finished around 1994. 
and they're still doing some renovation work to improve it even as we speak now. So this temple here is, I wouldn't say it's a replica, but it's an offshoot of the original Qin Sui in Fujian province. Um, so I thought I'd do a paranormal shoot here tonight because it's uh, beautiful. It's very, very nice and we're here and the moon is nearly full. The moon is directly in front of me. It's nearly full, it's beautiful. Um, today's story is supernatural, not scary, not ghostly, not frightening, but it's supernatural. And it happened when I was 15. When I was 15 years old, I had left New Jersey and I had hitchhiked across the country through the Southern states to California. And I met a lot of people along the way when I was hitchhiking. It took me about five, six days to get across the United States when I was hitchhiking. Before Arizona, one or two states before Arizona, I had met this guy who actually had left the eastern side of the United States and had everything he owned inside a van. And he was going to Oregon. And he was gonna join a commune over there associated with Osho, as far as I remember. And so we really got on really well, like a house on fire. And I was talking about Buddhist philosophy with him. He was telling about Hindu philosophy because he was a Hindu. And uh, he drove a van and he had all his earthly material items in the van. And it was really cool. And one state away from Arizona, we picked up a Native American Indian. He was in his late 20s. He was married. And so he was going to go to, I think, uh, California or something also. So the guy driving me was going to go to Oregon. I was going to California. The American Indian uh, was going to California also. Anyway, we started talking. And the American Indian told me about a special mountain that existed in Arizona. And uh, I would have to get off somewhere in Flagstaff, as far as I remember. If I go north, what happens is there's a mountain there. And it's kind of solitary. And there lives a spirit, an American Indian spirit, a good spirit, who gives prophecy for the future for people. And his name was Wenachi. And I was so fascinated by Wenachi. I was so interested in Wenachi. I asked him details. So the American Indian boy said to me, well, you got to get off around Flagstaff. And over there, they have huge Hopi Indian reservations. And um, once I get there, I need to go north on the highway until I hit this mountain where Wenachi lives. And when I get to the base of the mountain, there are American Indians there who sell rabbit pelts and sticks, well, basically rabbit pelts. So you would walk up the mountain and they said that there's a path and people, there are people there who know. And you walk up the path and you would actually erect with a stick, a small teepee and then you cover it with a rabbit pelt. And after you cover it, you leave it there and you go down the mountain and you come back the next day. When you come back the next day, what is supposed to happen is there's gonna be another teepee identical to the one that I erected or you have erected next to it. And that's a sign that Wenachi will see you. And once you see that one, you wait there and then you will see nearby a cave. And from a cave will come a man, an American Indian man, and he will talk to you and ask you what you need and you need to tell him that you know you have some very important questions that affect your life and he will guide you into the cave and he will let you ask any question that you want he will let you talk as much as you want and he has the power of the future he has the gift of prophecy and so this spirit or this being this nature being will actually answer all your questions and what you need to know. And you know, when this young American Indian guy told me this, I was really excited because I thought to myself, wow, I mean, I just left home and I'm gonna go to New Jersey. I, I mean, I left New Jersey and I'm gonna go to California and I don't know what I'm gonna do, you know, where, where I'm gonna stay, um, am I gonna survive? Will I find a Dharma center? Because I was actually going there to live independently, find a Dharma center and study and work. Because I couldn't do that with my parents in New Jersey. And so what happened was, um, I wanted to see Wenachi. I wanted to meet Wenachi. And I wanted to ask him questions. And I wanted to talk to him. And I wanted to find out what's gonna happen to me. And this American Indian boy just talked to me and this, the driver, I mean the guy who owned the car, the other guy who was driving, was listening also and I just I was so excited and I thought no I want to go meet Wenachi so I'm 15 I'm like driving 
somewhere on the border uh, entering Arizona. And I want to go meet with Nachi. And I thought, wow, you know, I'm going to ask him questions. I'm going to find out what's going to happen to me and what I'm going to do. This is perfect. I mean, for a 15 year old runaway who's got $50 in his pocket, it is a dream come true. And I've always been interested in the mystical, the paranormal, you know, um, prophecy and things that can come in the future. I've always been interested in that. So what happened was the guy who is now my friend uh, to drop me off in Flagstaff. And the guy said, well, are you sure? Because, you know, you're not far away from California. And I said, yeah. So I said goodbye to that guy, the, the guy going to the commune, and I said goodbye to uh, the American Indian guy. And they, they drove off on their own, and they left. And I never saw them again, never heard about them again. I got off of Flagstaff, and I hitchhiked. And you know, throughout my whole five, six days of hitchhiking across the United States, I really had not many problems getting rides. It was, you know, the most I had to wait was one or two hours on the, on the highways and byways of the US, but I always got rides. But it was really weird because the minute I got off of this van and I started going north, I couldn't get a ride. And I walked and walked and walked and walked and walked half a day. I would really say half a day, okay? I walked half a day and I was just exhausted. I had my bags because I had one uh, bag, duffel bag full of books. I had another duffel bag with some statues and, and um, my clothes. And I hadn't taken off my shoes in days and I hadn't washed in days. And, and I was just walking and walking and I was really tired and I was getting exhausted. And you know, no matter how many car, cars came by, I would hitchhike, I just couldn't get a ride. Nobody would take me. What I was traveling on was a highway, but it wasn't a really wide one. It was going towards the mountains and I can see the mountains straight ahead of me, clearly. Um, I asked a few, American Indians there about Wenatchee, they wouldn't talk to me. I knocked on a few doors. Some said they didn't know. Some said that they didn't want to talk. Some said they never heard about it. But, and I kept walking. And then it started to rain. And the rain was very light. And I got really worried because where I was walking by this time, there's no buildings. There's no rest stops. There's nothing. It's just green and green and trees and the mountains ahead. And there's some huge billboards. And the billboards doesn't really have a cover, but if you stand behind it, I guess you can kind of get some of the rain off of you, you know? And I stood behind a billboard and I kind of, kind of just shook my legs and feet because I was so tired. And I made a prayer. And I said, you know, if I'm supposed to meet Wenatchee, then I'm going to get a ride toward the mountains. If I'm not supposed to meet Wenatchee, then if I turn around and go the opposite direction, I'll get a ride. I made that kind of prayer and I, I just said, because I got exasperated and I got tired. Maybe I should have pushed forward. Maybe it wasn't meant for me. Maybe it was the wrong direction. I don't know. But I know that I said, okay, that's it. You know, um, I went out, I hitchhiked again. I couldn't get a ride. So I turned my mind around and I said, I'm going back. I'm going back down south instead of toward the mountains, against the mountains, back to the highway that takes me west. So now I'm going to go south and I'm gonna, once I hit the main highway, I think it was highway nine. Then I'm gonna go west to California and I'm gonna look for a Dharma center. And you know what? I bought some apples. I think you get 12 for $1 at that time, green, small apples. And I ate the apples and I stuck my thumb out. I think within a half hour, 45 minutes, I got a ride. It was just amazing. I didn't get a ride the whole day and I get a ride. And you know what? It was an American Indian lady. And she was very nice. And I got in and I told her that I left home and and I told her I was looking for Wenatchee and I told her what I was doing and she just said she's never heard of Wenatchee, she doesn't know anything. And I said, oh, I said, well, can you just take me down to, to 9, Highway 9? She said, sure. She was real nice. She was real sweet and she drove me all the way there and it rained lightly and I didn't get wet and that was it. I never got to see Wenatchee. I never found Wenatchee. I never could even get close. And even when I'm telling you this right now, I'm kind of getting goosebumps and my hairs are kind of standing up and you know, on my head and on my body because in my heart, I know Wenatchee exists. I know he's there. But why is it when I'm going towards him, I couldn't get a ride. I couldn't find his place and nothing went my way. And how come when I turned the opposite direction, I immediately got rides. I didn't get wet. And in fact, after a short while, the rain stopped. 
I remember the rain stopping. I was thinking, that's weird. So I guess in this story, there are paranormal beings who are not ghosts, who are not poltergeists, who are not evil spirits, who are not a magician's conjured up jinn, but they're actual elemental beings or beings that have lived in the area for a long time that do have the gift of prophecy. Perhaps if I had met him, he wouldn't have led me to the place I needed to go or I should have gone. And perhaps when I went the opposite directions, my personal Buddhas or deities led me to the place where I'm supposed to go. And you know, to this day, I'm 46, this is like, you know, 30 years later, I remember vividly about Wenachi, the young American Indian boy who told me about him, the van driver who gave me a ride across three, four states, and my search for him in Arizona and Flagstaff going up north. I remember going towards the mountains. I remember not getting any rides. I remember every single detail about Wenachi. And you know, to this day, I wonder, does he exist? And what would he have said to me if I actually went up that mountain where Wenachi lives and met him? What would he have said to me? See you guys soon. I thank you for joining me. Good night.